you believe God is good, give him praise in the house. Back there, didn't raise their hand. We're gonna to have to pray that through. That's all right. 
Almost everyone in this room has some, had someone come against you at some point in your life. Things come against us. The world comes against us. That's just life. It does happen. But in this case, Nineveh came against God's people. Nineveh literally came against God's people. It destroyed Israel and Judah. Now, I don't know. I've never had this happen. But I can pretty much assure you that if you kill one of my kids... Jesus is going to have to hold my salvation for a few minutes, and then I'll ask him to get it back. Amen. Straight up truth. I love you, but don't mess with my family. You want to take a ball bat and beat my skull in? I'll loan you the bat, but don't touch my kids or my family. Don't do it. Pretty simple, right? God's children was Israel. And the Assyrians and the Ninevites came against them and destroyed them. Literally came, took their city, destroyed them. And what we find happens is, God's going to get them, right? God's going to get them. Jonah chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. You have it, we'll stand for the reading of God's word. Jonah chapter 3. Beginning with verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. You know, the first time he ran, he went to another city, he tried to get away, he ended up in the belly of a fish. Uh, and this is the second time that the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. If you spent three days in the belly of a fish and you came out with all that stomach acid and all that, and God said, hey, you want to do what I told you to do the first time? You'd probably go, right? <laughs> Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, verse 3, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and he covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, Let neither man nor beast Herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Brother Tim, will you bless the reading of the word? Lord, thank you for your presence there, Lord. I ask that you be the mouthpiece of our pastor, Lord, that he be the mouthpiece of you. Lord, again, I thank you for all your blessings and each other. Let this set the heart for your name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Between 720 and 600 B.C., Assyria and Nineveh did bad things. Isaiah and other books of, speak of Nineveh being the capital city for over 50 years, as I've already said to you. And then here we have God. The God of all creation, right? And he is turning to Jonah and he's telling them to go to the Ninevites, this evil city that has destroyed his people, and he said, I want you to preach to them and tell them that I'm going to destroy them. I want you to go preach to them and tell them that I'm going to destroy them. Jonah says, nope, I don't like them, let them die. I ain't saying nothing. Gets on a boat, goes the other way, pays the money to go the other way. Actually, the ship gets into a great storm. The word says a storm sent by God. The sailors are about to lose their lives. Yeah, I looked it up in the original Hebrew. I, I saw your eyes. It's, it's pretty awesome. It's actually a, the breath of God, a ruach, if you will, that created the storm. Um, but he literally said, Jonah said to the people, it's my fault, throw me overboard. And they didn't want to throw him overboard because they were afraid of God, Yahweh, Jehovah. And, but they finally threw him over and the storm calmed. 
It's an intense story in Jonah chapter 1. God had prepared a great fish to swallow him up. He's in the belly three days, and Jonah repents in the belly of the fish. And so when he does this, then the fish spits him out, and God says, and I love this about God, because if you've ever been out of the will of God, here's kind of what happens. You get out of the will of God, you do things your way, and God's like in a holding pattern waiting for you to come back. So you get spit out of the fish's belly and God says, ready to go? You're like, man, if I had just went the first time, I wouldn't have went through all this, right? But he didn't. He literally, Jonah said, yeah, I'm ready to go, let's do this. So he goes into Nineveh and he begins to preach to the Ninevites this awful, evil, a rotten people, and the scripture says they began to repent. From the least to the greatest, they began to repent. And word came to the king of Nineveh, and he said, Let everyone, everyone, everyone be on a fast. Not a sip of water, not a bite of food, and not just the people, but even the animals, even the livestock are going on a fast. You're going to wear sackcloth and you're going to wear ashes. And maybe, just maybe, the Hebrew God, Yahweh, will turn his anger away from us. Maybe, just maybe. I want to back up for just a minute. How many of us have needed God to move in a mighty way in our lives? The Ninevites needed God to move. But do you know what I do most days when I need God to move? I eat more instead of less. How many times in the life of modern day Christians do we actually fast for anything? Whether that be social media, whether that be food. Some say it has to be food. But when is the last time you have fasted before God for your city? When is the last time you have fasted for your children? Nineveh is about to be destroyed, and if we believe God's word, in the last days, there's coming ugly times. Peerless times will come. Folks, if you're not looking around, there's some peerless times going on out Amen. there. Amen. So as children of God, we're rebuking Satan. Good. But the scripture says, before you rebuke him, submit yourself to God. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to give you the next eight days. I'm going to ask you to pray about a fast. The families in our church are under attack. The church is under attack constantly. Let's be real. Our cities and our country is under attack. One of the greatest political attacks I've ever seen. Yes. And I believe that God would have us fast. I don't care what you fast, but it needs to be something that's important to you. I'm asking you to pray about it till next Sunday. The fast will start on December 2nd. It'll be 21 days. It'll end on the 23rd, so you won't miss Thanksgiving and you won't miss your Christmas meal if you're fasting that. If you're on medications and those type of things, then you know what? Skip one meal a day or skip TV or something. Do something different. And expect God to do something different that Miss Wendy spoke about in first service. But here's what I saw happen here. The Ninevites literally turned back to God. Or turned to God. They repented in sackcloth and ashes. And they began to fast saying, maybe we serve Christ who has already done the work. We don't have a maybe attached to our promise, but we have a guarantee attached to our promise. And if they knew how desperate it was to repent before God, how much more should we be repentant before God? How much more should we as the body of Christ genuinely repent before God and begin to cry out to a holy God and say, God, I need you. Second Chronicles says, if my people, which are called by my name, by the way, if you're a Christian, you're called by the name of Christ. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and
and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will answer and I will heal their land. That's a promise from Almighty God. So I'm going to continue my evil ways. I'm not going to seek his face. I'm going to seek his hands instead. Serious times call for serious Christians. Yes. Serious times call for serious Christians. The Ninevites were not Christians. They were evil, evil people. Which brings me to my next point. We serve a God that forgives. We serve a God that literally forgives. Why do I bother with these men? That's really good. It helps me, right? Verse 10. Michael, will you put verse 10 on the screen for me? And God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did not. If God loves the Ninevites, the Assyrians who have come against him from the day they were birthed until this moment in time, if he loves them enough to say, you know what? If they're willing to repent before me, I'm going to hold back everything I said I would do. And for the next 150 years, God did not pass judgment on the Ninevites because he loved them enough. He loved them enough to take Jonah and send him there. He loved them enough. And church, if we don't understand this today, if we don't comprehend this, if we don't get to a place where we realize just because the drug addict's done it a hundred times and we're convinced he's going to continue, if we don't comprehend that God is reaching out to him and he's calling us to reach out to him. Sometimes, Tim, I feel like I'm no better than the Ninevites. I've trampled God underfoot so many times. But here's the next point. And somebody needs to hear this point. You're not too bad for God to save. Amen. Now, I know with everything in me, if God gives me a strict salvation message, that someone needs to hear it. That means someone here is not a born-again child of God. Maybe you were and you walked away. I don't know the situation, but here's what I know. The enemy has told some people that you're not good enough. That you've gone too far. That you are too guilty. And we confuse conviction of the Holy Spirit with condemnation of the enemy. Uh -huh. That's right. And even though we may step out and accept Christ, somewhere in the back of our mind, we're not good enough anymore. It's not. We're not good enough. And the enemy has literally lied and told the people of God that you're not good enough. The Ninevites destroyed God's people, and yet he made a way and a path. He took a ship. He took sailors. He took Jonah. He took everything on planet Earth that he could to tell them, if you will just truly ask for my forgiveness, I will forgive you. So many people are going to end up splitting hell wide open because they were convinced that the enemy had convinced them that they would never be good enough for God. And if these guys were good enough for God, I think we got a shot. But we've got to begin to make our minds see what God says. And the story that God presents. And not that your mom or your dad told you you were never good enough. And it's been beaten into your brain since day one. You need to get that garbage out of your mind and say, if God can save the Ninevites, he can surely save me. Because as rotten as I am, I've never went out and tried to destroy God. And we need to understand that there is forgiveness. And that God loves us so much. Can you picture the person that destroyed and killed your family? And you sending someone to make sure that they made it. To make sure that they're going to be okay. That's what Christ did. That's what God did in the Old Testament for the Ninevites. Scripture says, they said, if there's any hope at all, 
God said, you see their works? They're trying. I'm not going to destroy them. I'm going to take care of them. Do you know that right now, God is reaching out to you. God is reaching out to you to say, I love you. I'm not out to get you. I'm out to help you. It's one of the hardest lessons men and women of God will ever learn. That God loves us. He doesn't hate us. He's not out to get us. Well, if I can pray the certain salvation prayer, can I give you the best salvation prayer I've ever heard? Jesus, save me! It's all I got. I don't know anything else. Save me. Jesus, heal me! Because let's be real. Are we praying for the body? It's the mind of the body of Christ that is in desperate need of healing. We are in desperate need of a delivering God to touch our mind. And he is begging to do that. And he is literally reaching out. If I had been God, I would have torched the Ninevites without a word. They wouldn't even have known it was coming. And yet he sent a prophet. So that they might make an effort. That he might save them. I know in Nahum he destroyed the city. But they turned his back on him, their backs on him again. That was 150 years later. I'm not going to make it another 150 years to turn my back. But church, I know this with everything in me. The enemy wants to convince us we're not good enough. The enemy wants to convince us we're not worthy of anything from God. And God said it was never about your worthiness. It's always been about the worthiness of my son. And if you're living in guilt today, you need to let it go now. You need to walk away from that garbage. You need to walk away from the mentality and the stinking thinking that because that doesn't matter what you did this morning. If you are truly repentant, God truly forgives. Why do I want you to go on a fast? It's because God's people need God to move in our lives. We need God to move. I never call church to a fast. But today I'm asking you to do that because I believe that once we begin to fast that one thing and we want to go there and we we trade that thing for prayer. We trade that meal for prayer with God till we're not hungry anymore. We trade that whatever it is, that TV, that social media, whatever it is that we trade that thing, that fear, whatever it is that we trade it for prayer time with God, all of a sudden God begins to renew and restore our minds and He begins to draw us. And the next thing you know, there's an empowerment that you didn't even realize you had. Scripture says that there will be a great falling away. If you study it out, do you know what it says before that? There's going to be a great revival. There's going to be a great drawing to God before the falling away. It will actually kind of happen at the same time. I don't intend to be one of the ones that have fallen away. I'm going to be one of the ones that draw closer. Find heaven or hell to get there, but I'm going there. The definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. How many of God's children are doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result? If we begin to truly repent, and that's what this story is about, is take Jonah out of the equation. This is the Ninevites. First of all, you're not too far gone. And you never have been, and you never will be. I should be good right here, but I'm not going to. If you were raised and ever saw Bible tracts, remember when they passed out Bible tracts? There was one that, uh, that talked about a man that drug his daughter out of a revival. She wanted to be saved. And then he went back years later, and, and he preached and told them that God's Spirit had left him, and he wished he could be saved, but he couldn't. See, I would argue that every way, inside, outside, upside down. 
Because as long as God is speaking to your heart and calling you, as long as there is a desire in you, God's Spirit has not left you. So at the end of the day, let me ask you a question. What are you carrying that you shouldn't be carrying anymore? What are you carrying? What hard feelings towards me? God, I'm sorry if I've ever hurt you. Not the God's <coughs> word, but I'm sorry if I have ever personally offended you. But the scripture says we're going to be offended. And at the end of the day, here's what it says. Like it or not, this is what it says. It says, if I'm offended with you, that I need to repent for my offense. But you don't know what he did to me. I know what the Assyrians did to God. But if I carry an offense against you, my job is to repent for my offense. doesn't matter what you've done to me. My job is to get my heart right. And then let God be God in your life. And we're missing what God has for us. Because there's not true repentance anymore. There is, but not like we should see it. And we're missing because the enemy has guilted us into believing that we can't be forgiven. Oh, I screwed up so bad. Oh, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. You want a list of what I've done in this sermon? You really don't. Someone come to me this week about a, an application for ministry and they go, what if something comes back that I was like in trouble when I was younger? I said, I don't know. I got arrested so many times they called me and said, you want to come down or you want us to come pick you up? <laughs> Pull up the phone records. They're there. The East Ridge Police Department. Mr. Woody, we need you to come down here and let us, if you let us, if you come down, we'll just book you and let you go. We won't make you stay overnight. I'll be there at three. Because <laughs> I wasn't a good person. And I still make mistakes every day. But there's those beautiful verses like he makes his mercy new every day. And when I repent, he say, God, forgive me. And he says, let's start fresh today. And I'm thinking, why would you love me like that? And then I see examples like this, and I'm thinking, you know what? God doesn't hate me. God loves me. God actually loves me. Through all my mess, through all my screw-ups, he picked me. He picked you. The first step in repentance is being born again. You have to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. For those of you that were raised in a Christian home, and well, Mama was saved, Daddy was saved, they just always told us we were, it doesn't work like that. You've got to know Him as your own Lord and Savior, period. It's not about how good you do things. None of that really applies at this point. What applies is knowing Christ in your heart, beginning a journey with Him. And I know there are people here today that need to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. <coughs> the second part is, is to get rid of it when the enemy puts those guilty sounds in your mind. You're not good enough. You did this. You can't be forgiven. Well, the person beside me did this. Take it captive. Kick it out because it literally states in Corinthians that it comes against the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God says we are forgiven. If we truly repent, we are forgiven. And we get a new slate. And when we screw up, He restores if we truly repent. You come to a point where there's no more repentance in you, then you've walked away from your salvation. Church, I believe that we're on the verge of something big in the Spirit of God in America. Amen. But it's not going to happen if God's people do not get their hearts in tune with God. That means repentance. That means stopping the stinking thinking. And start moving forward for the kingdom of God. What did I learn from the Ninevites? God will give anybody a chance. Anybody. No matter how screwed up we are, God is waiting to 
to restore and to put back what the enemy has stolen. I don't know about you, but I need that in my life. And I believe that there are men and women in this room that need to be born again. I believe there are men and women that need to come back. And I believe that there are men and women that need to say to the enemy, you're no longer going to control my mind. For too long, you've laid guilt trips on me. For too long, you've laid everything on me. And I'm done with it. I'm a child of the Most High God. And I'm going to win this fight no matter what. No matter what you say about me or against me. No matter how many people you have come against me. I'm a child of God. Stand with me if you will. Remember to give at the back if you can to help Tim and Laura. It would be greatly appreciated. Remember tomorrow night's Thanksgiving dinner and tonight's Miss Faith. But forget all of that for two more minutes and ask yourself a question. God, is there anything between me and you that I need to work on? Is there anything I'm harboring in my mind that I need to let go of? Is there anything I need to depend on? Lord, do I truly know you? Do I need to be born again? And I hope they're going to play a song called Just As I Am. It's an old song. But that's how God is looking for you to come, like the Ninevites, just as you are. Father, have your way in your precious name.